Oceans Rise. Book 4 in the Siren of War series. Written by Demelza Carlton. Auto narrated by AI Charlotte from Google. 1. Lass, I love you dearly, but I've scarcely slept in a fortnight, we've made love so late into the night. I know you rest during the day, but I can't sleep at work. What would the mine crew say? They'll be calling me Sleepy McGregor. I don't deny I was disappointed to have William's magnificent body lying beside instead of inside mine, but he told the truth, we'd made love more times than I could count since our stranding on West White Beach. It was as if we both knew our time together was constrained by the growth of the child inside me, for after her birth we'd be forever changed. We'd be a family. Sighing, I snuggled against him and sank into sleep. No nighttime swims for me anymore, mother patrolled the cove and the dolphins were everywhere, sharing gossip until it flowed faster than water. If I dipped a toe beneath the ocean's surface, she would hear of it. And William's life would be in danger. It felt like I'd barely closed my eyes when William slipped out of bed, promising to see me at breakfast. Pregnancy made me more somnolent than ever, I nodded and went straight back to sleep, only to be woken by a kiss from William when the sun was high in the sky. You missed breakfast lass but if you hurry you can be dressed in time to join me for lunch. I scrambled out of bed and into suitable afternoon clothes barely pausing to splash some water on my face before I reached for a comb to tame my sleep-tangled locks. I'd managed to deal with half of it when I heard Sarah's quiet steps approaching. How are you feeling this morning? she asked. I waited until she appeared in the doorway before I replied, fine. A little tired, is all. My stomach gurgled and my daughter kicked it from inside my womb. I wish I could see her angry face, for I was sure she would be. All the movement distracted me and I realized, there's no morning sickness today. Sarah smiled. It's about time it went away. You have the glow of motherhood about you now instead of the green tinge of illness. Was my insatiable lust for William part of my pregnancy, or just my natural response to William's evident ardor for my increasingly rounded form? Not that my breasts had been small before, but now, none of my brassiers fit properly and I'd had to send to Singapore for more underthings. Luckily Anne and Jackson had sailed with the Islander at the beginning of last week, and we expected their return any day now. Sarah's impatience won and she seized the comb from my fingers, dragging it through my hair as if trying to carve my scalp with the teeth. Not like handing my comb to William, whose every stroke was a caress. Still five minutes later, she'd pinned my hair up for me and we headed for the dining room where William waited. I tucked into my lunch as if I were eating for two and I guess I was, two people as well as two meals to make up for the breakfast I'd missed, letting William and Sarah talk. He spoke of the islander docking while I slept, and the huge fish the coolies had caught fishing last night, now the monster shark had mysteriously disappeared. He moved restlessly in his seat, his eyes darting from his food to me and back to his plate, even when Sarah spoke. I wondered what news he'd received from the islander that he couldn't share with Sarah and I. I didn't think it was bad news, as he seemed on the brink of blurting something out for most of the meal, yet when Amar took the empty plates from the table, his eagerness only increased, so he hadn't spilled his news yet. Perhaps it was someone who'd arrived on the islander, I guessed. Another of his relatives, or a dear friend. Anne and her husband were undoubtedly aboard, but their return home was hardly news. I caught the faint chugging of an engine approaching, it sounded like William's motorcycle, but as he was here, the sound evidently heralded the arrival of Jackson, the acting island manager, on his aging triumph. William threw his napkin on the table and rose, grinning widely. Was it Jackson's return he'd so eagerly awaited? Surely not. Sounds like the Jacksons are home. Care to come greet them, lass? William held out his hand and curiously first took it, letting him pull me outside. He left me in the shade of the veranda, trotting down the steps to meet Jackson as he pulled up in our garden. Behind me, Sarah sidled out of the door, no less curious than I was. 
After all, she knew her brother and his excitement must have been just as obvious to her. What is it? she asked softly. I shrugged. Mr. Jackson's returned, and it looks like he has a new motorcycle. This one's not rusted at all. More than not rusted, this one was black and shiny and completely unlike William's or Jackson's. Yet as I peered at the blue logo on the fuel tank, barely a shade lighter than my tail, I realized that this was also a Triumph, dot but a much newer model. William stood beside the Triumph as Jackson dismounted, spreading his arms wide. What do you think, lass? I want one, was my first thought. The second was that I needed to know more about riding one. A mermaid on a motorcycle was joke enough without me wobbling around with no idea of what I was doing. This model has twin shoe brakes instead of the dummy belt rim ones my Triumph has. And this has the new low-pressure, wire-edge tires which won't jolt so much. The ride will be much smoother. The oil. Pregnancy must have dulled my wits, for Sarah understood better than I did. She stormed down the steps. Will you're a bloody fool. Buying your pregnant wife a motorcycle? What kind of crazed idea is that? You think she wants to ride that throbbing thing while she's carrying your child in her belly? You're a wonderful, wonderful man. I couldn't seem to speak the words. I just stared at him and the motorcycle but mostly at him. William understood though. Since the day we met on the Travessa, he'd been reading my eyes and the thoughts behind them. I stumbled down the steps, clutching at the handrail to slow my descent, my eyes never leaving William's. Once I stood on flat ground I threw myself into his arms, planting fervent kisses on his mouth, his cheeks and any part of his face I could reach. Jackson's voice cut through my euphoria. You mean this magnificent machine is for your wife? McGregor you're crazy man. My wife wouldn't touch one of these things, let alone know how to ride one. Or appreciate the engineering that went into creating it. He stroked the curved fuel tank so fervently I wondered if he'd ever touched Anne that way. I doubted it. In fact it was almost obscene. Mr. Jackson, I'll thank you to stop fondling my motorcycle. He flushed and backed away from it. William chuckled. So you like it, lass? I wanted to cover him in kisses all over again. Tonight, certainly. Yes. Thank you so much, William. I can't wait for you to show me how to ride it. I dropped my voice so low only he could hear it. And afterwards, I let my eyes speak for me. William wrapped his arms tightly around me. Good thing I have the rest of the afternoon off then, with all the coolies unloading in the port, instead of up the mine today. I think we should take your new baby for her first trip to the grotto. I laid a hand on my belly as my eyes strayed to my new shiny toy, reflecting the noon sun. My loins already ached in anticipation. Absolutely. 2. I fastened the buttons on my leather jacket, surprised that the riding leathers I'd bought in Singapore still fit. Even the pants made it around my midsection, though they were a little snug. The soft feel of leather against my skin was sensual, driving my pregnancy heightened senses to distraction. William would relieve my sexual tension when we reached the grotto, I promised myself, as I pulled on my leather gloves. These were ladies' gloves, unlike William's riding gloves, covering my hands to just past my wrists and flaring properly to still allow me freedom of movement. I even managed to pull on my boots without removing my gloves. And these were the sort of boots I'd only seen men wear, for I'd never owned boots so big. These didn't just cover my feet to the ankle, they encased my calves to just below my knees. When I was done, I glanced in the mirror. For the first time in my life, I truly looked like a daughter of the gold line, clad head to foot in golden brown from my felt hat to the toes of my boots. The absence of my tail flukes gave me away though. Today, a mermaid would ride her first motorcycle, symbolic of my surrender to living my life solely on land with William. I strode out to meet him. Sarah rose from her seat on the veranda. 
Maria, you really should reconsider. Think of your child and the danger. I shook my head. She'll be fine. We both will be. William grinned on the grass below, having heard our exchange, but when I stepped out of the shadow of the veranda, letting the sun light up my leathers, his expression glowed with admiration. He swallowed as if his mouth was dry, even as his eyes drank me in. Lass you look, magnificent. Whatever I looked like, all I felt was nervous as I mounted my motorcycle. I ran my fingers over the curve of the fuel tank, before I tentatively grasped the handlebars. I can't remember what to do first, I admitted. Clutch, William said, nodding at my left hand. I stared at the two levers. I knew one controlled the spark, so the other had to be the clutch. What's it do? It disconnects the gearbox so you can change gears. Oh! I always thought it was called the crunch, because that's the noise Tony's truck made whenever he changed gears. I smiled ruefully. William's smile had vanished. A man who couldn't ride a motorcycle, and couldn't drive a truck properly either. And he tried to steal you from me. Next time I'm in Fremantle, he won't get off so lightly with a few mud spatters. William. Forget about my old boss and everyone else. It's just you, me and this complicated machine. I stared at the levers in front of me and dropped my voice to a whisper. Maybe Sarah's right and I should wait until after the baby's born. There's so much to learn and I can barely remember how to stir my tea anymore. Where's my fearless lass? I thought you wanted to come with me to the grotto for a romantic swim together. It isn't hard and I know you rode well the first time. You even enjoyed it. William's smile mirrored my own. Can you remember which lever controls the spark? I tapped it without hesitation, adjusting it to the middle. Throttle then air. I opened the throttle lever up the tiniest bit, then fiddled with the air until William seemed satisfied. Fuel. Cautiously, I released a little fuel until the stench of it assailed my nostrils. Now give it a kick. I hadn't used the kickstart before, William had done it for me the first time. I touched my toes to it. You have to stamp on it like a giant spider you're afraid will bite you, lass. I wasn't afraid of spiders. They responded to my voice as readily as crabs. And my triumph was much bigger and heavier than even the robber crabs on the island. I shifted my foot so my heel rested on the kickstart lever and stomped down hard, as if I was trying to break a man's foot. The engine coughed into life and I cheered. Now adjust the spark and the throttle until it sounds right. A hint of doubt had crept into William's voice. Do you remember what it should sound like? He was asking a siren if she remembered her favorite song, the sound of her beloved returning home. And not just any siren, but possibly the most powerful singer in the Indian Ocean. Biting back my smile, I nodded. Under my careful hands, my motorcycle assumed a perfect rhythm. Do you want me to lift the stand, or do you think you can do it? Just roll it forward a bit and good. Lift it a bit with your foot and, ah, don't worry about it, lass. I'll hook it up out of your way. I heard the clink of metal on metal. Do you know how to change gears? No. I searched the Triumph for some button or lever I'd missed. William's hand closed over my right hand and guided it to a knob beside the fuel tank. I clutched the clutch in my other hand and pulled on the knobbed gear change lever. You're ready to go, lass. I'll ride beside you and remind you when to change gears. You're in the bottom gear at the moment, because we'll be headed up to the plateau before we take the track down to Waterfall. Now, do you remember how to speed up and how to stop? I tapped the throttle. That wants to go faster. To stop I make it slow down with this then use the brakes. I touch the brake lever with the smallest finger on my right hand. And the main brakes here for my foot. My left boot grazed the pedal. 
William's mouth claimed mine in a kiss that ignited my insides more effectively than the spark burning fuel beneath me. You're a natural at this, lass, and you haven't forgotten a thing. Are you ready? I nodded once. He jumped on his triumph and kicked it to life, adjusting everything without even glancing at it. Off you go, lass. I'll be right behind or beside you. Nice and slow to start. I released the clutch and opened up the throttle, lifting my boots up to the footboards. Williams didn't have these, he may do with pegs. Watch the road, lass. In panic, I lifted my eyes from his powerful leather-clad legs to the muddy track curving away in front of me. I had to touch my foot on the ground more than once to keep the bike upright as I wobbled around the curve, but I made it. Don't take your eyes off the road. Hitting a crab could cause you to lose control of your motorcycle and I wouldn't want you to get hurt. I nodded and hunched my shoulders into the wind. Crabs might respond to a song but machines wouldn't and I could hardly sing the whole way, warning creatures out of my path. We're about to level out now. Time to change gears up. I did as I was told and found myself flying again, just as I had the first time. William was right. I was his fearless lass and I loved this almost as much as I did him. 3. I slowly released the clutch as my triumph stuttered into silence. Unclenching my hands from the handlebars, I climbed stiffly off the motorcycle. I hadn't realized quite how tensely I'd been riding until now, when relaxing nearly sent me sliding bonelessly to the mud. William caught me around the waist before first could though. His warm kiss shot through me, bolstering me like a steel rod up my backbone. You rode beautifully, lass. I've never seen anyone maintain their balance so well on their first solo ride. You take my breath away, you're so perfect. Another kiss melted my insides as he pulled me against him. Warm leather against leather was almost as sensuous as skin on skin. A quick glance told me we were alone at the grotto. I could escape my leathers and lose myself in loving William for the afternoon. Still kissing him fiercely, I fumbled with the buttons on my jacket. Finally the last one popped free and I tried to shrug the hot garment off, but it stuck to my skin. I growled in frustration. William broke our kiss, laughing. What are you trying to do, lass? His eyes followed mine to the open front of my jacket. My God, you're not wearing anything under that. His hand slid inside my jacket, freeing my breasts. His fingers slid up over my shoulders, crushing my bare chest against him, and I managed to shed my jacket. William's jacket was next, then his uncomfortably tight pants. He still stood in his shirt and drawers, watching me as I peeled off my own leather pants. He swore as he saw that I hadn't bothered donning any underwear beneath my pants, so I stood naked before him. You're overdressed, William. He laughed and the remains of his clothes soon dangled from his handlebars. I threw myself at him once again, twining my legs around his body to get closer still. We overbalanced and ended up in the grass, rolling and laughing as we kissed, then kissed again. Slowly we joined, his body completing mine in a union so natural I never wanted to be apart from him again. Our lovemaking was leisurely, building to a bone-deep climax that made me scream, frightening the frigate birds into flight from a nearby tree. Afterwards we held tight to each other, irritating the child in my belly between us until she aimed a feeble kick in William's direction. You're covered in mud and dirt, lass. We should go for a swim, William murmured, making no move to release me. Reluctantly, I sat up and surveyed my body. He was right. I rose and sauntered to the entrance to the cave, feeling his eyes on me every step of the way. I climbed down the cliff into the grotto proper, letting the sun-warmed water caress my legs as I lowered myself in. It barely came to my waist, but it was deep enough to lie on the surface and float. I stretched out and kicked my legs up, seeing my belly rise in a distinct curve just above the surface. She was certainly growing in there, this daughter of ours. 
A strange way to thank the human for planting a child in your belly, but I suppose you felt it fitting. One more joining before you leave him. Men are so easily pleased. I jumped to my feet at the sound of mother's voice, just in time to glimpse movement in the tunnel that led to the lower cave. Her father's cave, where her cradle still hung. Did you spot the dragon lass? William appeared on the rock ledge above, grinning. He pointed at the tunnel entrance. That's where I saw it too. No of course not, I replied instantly. The only dragon in this pool is me. I've told you that before. I heard mother's soft laughter and the sound of skin on stone as she swam deeper into the tunnel and out of sight. He slid down the cliff and splashed into the water beside me. Your leathers certainly look like dragon skin and you wore nothing underneath, for a dragon wouldn't. And if you're a dragon, then so's this little one. He patted my belly, then gave a little snort of laughter. If we have a girl, we should call her Belinda. It was my grandmother's name and it means beautiful serpent or dragon in German, she said. Any girl of yours will be beautiful, dragon or not. What about Apalala? I asked lightly. That's what you called the dragon you thought you saw here. I'm pretty sure we conceived this child here at the grotto too, if not in the water. William wrapped his arms around me, pulling my wet body against his. We could make love in the water again, just like the first time. Desire flamed, but I knew mother was watching. The moment I let my guard down, she might hurt William. I wouldn't let her. I want to, I admitted, but last time you wore me out so much that I nearly fell asleep on the ride home. I can't afford to fall asleep while I'm riding your lovely gift. I softened my refusal by adding, and we still have tonight in our bed. There are some positions in that book of yours that we haven't tried yet, William mused, winking at me. He splashed water on himself, washing away the mud from our roll in the dirt above. True. Don't think I've finished thanking you for your gift either, I insisted. Satisfied that I was clean enough to don my leathers once more, I pointed upward. You go first. I might need your help climbing over that last bit at the top. I'm getting clumsier as this child grows. William leaned over to kiss my belly, before he started his climb. I kept my eyes on him, but nothing stopped my ears. Yes, send him away. It is time for your exile to end, child. Tonight you return home with me, along with the child you carry. Obedience has its rewards and yours will be rich indeed. I didn't bother answering her. I owed her no obedience. Not anymore. Nothing she could offer me could match my happiness with William and the approaching birth of our daughter. Mother could stay here and rot for all I cared. I wouldn't be traveling anywhere with her. Not tonight, not ever. 4. The judder of the Triumph's engine between my thighs only rattled me more on our ride home. Mother's presence had turned what should have been a pleasurable ride with my husband into something both sinister and sour. I threw my hat on the hall table as we entered the house, scattering pins but not caring. My leathers felt too constricting and Apalala moved uneasily inside me, like a school of startled fish. When I reached our bedroom, I unbuttoned my pants quickly, peeling them back from my belly. I stared critically at my increasingly curvy silhouette in the mirror, knowing I wouldn't be able to wear these pants again until after she was born. I cupped the distinctive bump between my hands, wondering whether her blue eyes would be as deep as William's or as stormy as mine. In five months I'd know, but until the time came, I'd have to protect both her and William from mother. She was the most respected elder among my people, which meant the most powerful person in the Indian Ocean. I knew I had the courage to oppose her, but would I have the strength to fight an entire ocean when she turned them against me? I crossed my arms over my chest, feeling terribly insignificant. Warm arms encircled me as William stepped in close behind me. I looked up at our reflections, meeting his eyes. 
Is there anything you can't do, my courageous lass? He asked, kissing my neck. What if I can't protect you? My heart cried out silently, but the admiration in his eyes said otherwise. His belief and trust gave me more courage than I knew I had, simply because he believed in me. How will you astonish me next? He continued. His gaze raked my reflection. If I help you out of your dragon skin, can I finish what we started at the grotto? Slowly, he unbuttoned my jacket and helped me out of it. I leaned back against him and for the first time realized that he was naked. His chest and belly were hard against my back as his arms pulled me close. His powerful thighs framed mine in the mirror, the hair on them glowing golden in the late afternoon sun. God you're beautiful. I need to see all of you. Same, I whispered, stroking a hand down his side. William laughed. Men aren't beautiful, lass. We're handsome or strong, powerful or gentle, but never beautiful. I stroked him again, harder. You're all of those things, William. And more. I'm lucky to have you. Fortune smiled on me the day you spotted me from the deck of the Travessa, and every day since. You look more beautiful now than the day I met you. His hands dropped to my belly, caressing the curve that hid Apalala from us. But I'll have to get these pants off to show you properly. William slid his hands into my pants, hooking his thumbs into the waistband, so that as he ran his fingers down my bum and my legs, he dragged my pants down with them until he met my boots. With his help, all three were soon in a jumble on the floor, and he rose to his feet to stand behind me again. Shift your feet a little further apart, lass, he whispered. I did as he asked, letting my curious eyes question his reflection, but he only smiled. William lifted my arms, stretching them toward the wall until he planted my hands on either side of the mirror. Brace yourself, lass. I felt his need pressing against me and understood. Oh, I'm ready. I have been since the grotto, lad. He chuckled. I feel like a callow lad with you, unsure of myself half the time, but I promise you, I'm a man. He grasped my hips and eased inside me, slowly enough to make me count every inch. Oh man. And yes. I couldn't look away from the unfathomable depths of his eyes. At the peak of each thrust, his smile seemed to grow wider and the pace quickened just a little, until I found myself pushing back against him with all my strength to hold him inside me just a little longer on each stroke. But even with his slow, steady rhythm, I could feel my release building. My breathing became panting and I closed my eyes to better focus on the myriad sensations coruscating through my body. Open them lass and look at us. I met his eyes in the mirror again and they were laughing. Not me, us. Look at the incredible woman your husband is making love to. He drove me closer to the cliff edge, yet held me there, not letting me fall until I shared his vision. Haloed in red gold down, his arm slung across my pelvis, keeping my hips from thrusting forward at his pleasurable onslaught. A shallow soup bowl of a belly rose above it, curving to the base of my bouncing breasts, both globes bobbing happily with each powerful thrust of his hips. My lips parted as if to draw in breath and moan at the same time. My half-closed eyes took in my reflection while wanting to lose myself in William's loving embrace. And above my shoulder was William's beloved face, devouring every inch of me with his eyes as his body gave me so much more in return. A siren and a human man, united in mutual desire. Never to be parted. Never. Ready, lass? Don't look away. Mutely, I nodded as it felt like my body fractured around him, held together only by his arms and the power of his love. I rose up onto my toes, my mouth opening wide to hail the heavens with his name. And I did. By water, I did. When he withdrew, covering my neck and back in kisses, I found I was shaking with the power of my incredible release. How did he make my body sing so sweetly? William had a sort of siren song all his own it seemed. I want to know how you do that, I whispered. Later I'll show you again. 
Right now we need to wash up and dress for dinner lass, he said, reaching for the water jug on the washstand. But I still need to thank you for the motorcycle, I insisted. Once is hardly enough. William appeared behind me, now clad in his drawers and a shirt. Anything for you, lass. How about tonight we go through that book you like so much, and see if we have time to try all our favorite positions before dawn. I do have a request though. He blushed. All that talk of water dragons and motorcycles at the grotto, has me thinking of how we made love on the back of my triumph that time. You know when you lay back, lifted your legs up. Like a mermaid? I said without thinking. Is that what you call it? Then yes. Tonight I'd like you to be my mermaid, if only for a little while. Will you be my mermaid, lass? I met his eyes. I will for as long as you'd like me to be, William. I meant it too. If only he knew.